Let's do this. <laughs> There's a cat. <laughs> yep. I had mine are all at home. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's let's kick it off. Hello, everybody. This is Matthias Beckers, and right on top of me is... This is uh, Alan Metzger here in Chicago land. Okay, so we decided to do a quickie today because uh, we have both got some time constraints. I need to go to a marriage tomorrow, and Alan is uh, busy at work, I believe. Busy at work. So... Um, I misread this article, Alan. I thought it said two EPRs, uh, but it's basically a new type of EPR. Um, <clears throat> so we were just talking about the EPR. Um, I think it's an awesome design because it's so big. It's basically the biggest reactor you can build at this moment, 1650 megawatts. Mm. And... Uh, any reactor is a good reactor <laughs> in in my mind right uh let's see where yeah. flaman wheel is right because flaman wheel yeah that's in you see so the funny thing is yeah they they, they pixelated flaman wheel uh, right now i have uh i have normandy uh i've got the normandy map on here um because I wanted to show Flamanville. This is where they are building, uh, you know, the only French EPR, Flamanville 3. And they're building two more EPRs at Hinkley C, which is somewhere around here in uh, England. Uh, let's see, Portishead. Am I too far in? I believe I am. Hinkley C, let's see where it is. Hinkley C. Um, so is there, is there any news on the, on the, on nuclear front in the U.S. in terms of possible, possible new reactors? Um, I haven't, uh, heard anything, um, really new lately that, uh, that we haven't talked about before. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, you know, I think that, uh, companies that are working on advanced design they're plotting forward and making some of them pretty phenomenal progress uh, but it's uh, it's a long slog yeah um, I think that uh, one of the things that that uh, I saw mentioned the other day is that uh, we you know we talk about what what we do to, to like really sway the public's opinion and one of the ideas that was put forth was uh, that we can you know, get people to, 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 to like it and everything, but what we really, um, you know, on, a, on an individual basis, but if we, but what we really, really need is uh, some really cool, you know, projects, I mean, even as small as they may be, but, but actual, you know, nuclear builds that we, that we do. So, so yeah. Vogel's going to be one of those, but it won't be for a few years, but they Did will finish Oakland? that. Vogel. Oh, Vogel. Vogel. Yeah. V O G T L E. Yeah. Uh, one in Georgia, state of Georgia here in the U.S. Um, they will finish those, and that'll be a good thing to be able to point to and say, that's great. Um, but I think even more interesting for a lot of people would be for us to be able to point to, you know, six units of new scale reactors in Utah oh, at, yeah. a, at, a, at a site or, um, you know, a, a terrestrial energy ismr imsr um well, at... you, you know i've got a good feeling about that because they will start building one of those within you know the next five years that's pretty much yeah current, i think right? uh, we will see the first ones getting started uh, before the middle of next decade yeah. and uh um i don't think a lot of them but uh they will be able to ramp up much more quickly once they've got the you know proof of concepts and pilots and you know first of a kind yeah. done uh, because of the smaller scale of it and I was in an ANS meeting last night uh, American Nuclear Society yeah a meeting here in Chicago we've got a Chicago section and it was at Exelon and and they talked about um, the presentation was on um, setting up next generation nuclear reactors nuclear plants that, that have next generation uh, nuclear reactors in them as semi-autonomous or, or even autonomous right um 
In other words, we don't have to have people there to operate it. We've got, you know, intrinsically safe designs. And so now yeah. we can, we can put sensors and, and networks and, and, uh, and they, at Argonne Labs here, the guy, that's where the guy was from. They've been developing software and code, uh, codes to, to, uh, to model these kinds of things and to do it in a way uh, that allows them, you know, allows the system to be most mostly autonomous and you have still operators that, that ultimately uh, can make it, you know, make, make decisions uh, based on all the much better information that they would get in that situation. But you don't need like the same systems engineers can, can look at the same types of systems at multiple plants and, you know, figure out which ones need to be maintained and that exactly. sort of thing. Yeah. So there's that, and and then there's and then the events that happen can be initially handled by the system, and then you know ultimately an operator would you know maybe make a decision to take the reactor offline or something yeah. if it really needed to. But but um, a lot of that stuff can be automated, and that that made me think about gosh, you know we we talk about you know nuclear jobs being really good, and there being lots of them. Um, and that's, this is a good reason why we shouldn't really rely on that, on, on, that, on that argument, argument so much. Yeah, I get because, it. I get it. Because the best, you know, the best energy is the one that is just there and, and is inexpensive and doesn't, you know, doesn't, you don't have to have a lot of people doing it. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I don't like about solar is that it requires so much manual labor yeah. to do and the manual labor that it needs is, is manual labor. I mean, it's yeah. not, you know, a glorified a glorious job at all it's great for people to have work like that that wouldn't have work otherwise and and they can can really better their lives that way and we we need jobs like that but but we shouldn't be saying this is what our economy is going to run on right right i understand i understand and here's the thing so in general nuclear jobs are good jobs and i think that you know having a couple of nuclear jobs is good but having an autonomous reactor <laughs> Well, wow, that's a game changer, you know. So uh, it really is. I don't and think I don't think that an autonomous reactor will be a no personnel reactor. There will always be some some sort of you know personnel right. needs in one of those reactors. But I think that the personnel you know that is required to run one of those will be orders of magnitude less than, for instance, a plant like the Apple Canyon, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, and uh, but that's very exciting. I, you know, I, I, I really hope that there's going to be some some really good progress and good actual stuff that we can really show, exactly. you know, before you know before my time is up here yeah. on this planet, because <laughs> because the, the more I, you know, the, the the older I get, the more I think, boy, you know, I'm going to miss some really cool stuff if I. You know, if they don't get moving on it. Exactly. Or unless I, you know, live It's like a glacial pace. It's like, we're coming, <laughs> but not way. very fast. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. just I just want to, because, because our time is slim, we, we only have like a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to, to tell you what prompted me to, you know, talk about the EPR, because I, I personally, I'm, I am a big fan of the EPR, even though, you know, all the cost overruns and the stuff that happened at Okiluoto and uh, EPR and, and Hinkley, Hinkley Point C in Flamanville, you know, um, they have built uh, EPR at Taishan. Unfortunately, you can't really see them that well. I'm, I'm having them in the in, in screen right now. These are very old pictures, mm. so it's yeah. all flat and gray. But the thing that always excited me about the EPR was that they were trying to do it really big. You know, uh, everybody is very excited about small modular reactors, and I think that's that's absolutely warranted because... There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there, but we mustn't forget about the big ones. I mean, you know, if if you want to go, yeah, I I I want to look at this from a boxing te from a boxing terminology. So uh, a small modular reactor is like a belter weight or you know a lightweight boxer. And, and and to be honest, in some cases, I really like to see heavyweight champions go at it at each other, you know. And the EPR is just one of the biggest heavyweight champions you can get. 
So, uh, but interesting, interestingly enough, Normandy, which is a province in France, one of one of my favorite vacation destinations. I've been there about thirty times in my life already. So I know the <laughs> wow. yeah, I know I know the region very well. It's not like uh, like it's uh, you know some a place I have never been to. But Normandy is putting itself forward as a candidate site for the construction of a new generation of French EPR nuclear power reactors and that's going to be called the epr2 and the epr2 is going to be a simplified scaled down version of the epr now they have put they've put a picture of flamenville 3 in this uh in in this uh this article here and i suspect that flamanville will be the place where they want to build these other two epr2 units as well because that's in normandy it's a, it's 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 a it's a mm. nice region to be actually uh, i wonder where i mean they won't be building those at the landing beaches you know because Normandy is the place. I don't know if yeah, I, right. I, I presume most of my viewers know this, but you know, I'll, right. I, the big, the lo- the largest part of the Normandy beaches were actually the beaches where the Allied forces landed in yeah. uh, uh, on June sixth. So uh, yeah, but it's pretty cool. I I, I just uh, I'm still working on the the thing that I said that I was working on. And uh, I finished it. And in my thing, in my article, the EPR has a prominent role as well. Because I'm basically touting it as probably the best solution for Netherlands, for the Netherlands to decarbonize, you know, like 100 megatons of coal-fired and gas-fired uh, um, capacity. Yeah, so really, all, that much emissions, right? Did you get to read it? Did you manage to read yeah. some of it? I- I, I did, and uh, I, I I really like it, that it it provides some hope and and a and a you know a a plan that's that's like thought out and and described in a way that doesn't just say you know we could just put a bunch of nuclear reactors and everything would be better, but it actually talks about here's what the benefits would be, here's what the costs would be, here's the you know the range. Yeah. of those things um and here's how they compare the different options that we have right. and that's you know i mean that's a really good first step into a serious discussion about you know let's let's make a decision to, to step out like that as a you know in your case as a as a, as a country yeah. uh, but even as a region or, or as you know a state i mean I, I i immediately started thinking about you know my state of illinois where we still have 35 you know percent coal yeah. generation you know let's get the moratorium you know kick kicked off the legislative books and and let's uh start talking about what is it going to take for us to replace those coal plants exactly. with small modular reactors because not you know none of them i don't think are big enough for you know a thousand megawatts of, of energy i mean you could you could put one there but but it would be um, it would be more appropriate if we had uh, a, a smaller one, and, and, and there are there are advantages to that, and that's yeah. one of the things that I thought was well, we could we could work on that. That gives me a reason to work on getting rid of the moratorium. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but you need to you know, and that's something that I always that, that that's always lacking from these discussions. Nobody is building like an outline that says this is why you should be building one of these. Right. And right. and it's not just from the you know nuclear rah 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 nuclear, but it's like okay, if you build this and you take this into consideration and you you make sure that you meet these goals and that these prerequisites are met, that you then can build a nuclear power power plant which will then provide you not just with this commodity but also with this economic output and you know these benefits and such and so forth because it's always about just about costs everybody's talking about costs oh this nuclear power plant is so expensive but nobody said nobody does nobody is fair enough to do a cost benefit analysis which if you do it would show you that even the most expensive nuclear power plant can be beneficial, uh, and and there, there there is a reason to build one of these things. But but 
I I haven't so seen let's spell it out. Yeah, yeah. Right. I haven't seen. That's what no, I liked about it. Yeah. So uh, so one of the things that I want to grab back to before we have to end this is I was looking at Flammenville. So that's a reactor complex where there's currently three reactors. I mean, Flammenville. Three, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Flammenville right. three is the EPR. The other two are, uh, I believe, Westinghouse pressurized water reactors. Uh, basically, it's a Westinghouse design uh, adopted by the French and then, you know, uh, altered somewhat. But the cool thing is, just above Flamanville, about I, I believe it's like twenty or thirty miles or something like it, is uh, is La Hague. Have you ever heard of La Hague? Yeah. Yeah, that's the yeah, where they reprocess all the all the nuclear spent fuel and uh, yeah, that's where they make mocks. France, right. Yeah. Actually, it's not just France; it's other places too, right? Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Right. That's where they make their mocks, so it's pretty close. So yeah, the French. I I, I always highly highly rate the French in terms of nuclear energy. They have earned it, and I think that they should keep it uh, at some you know keep it at a respectable level, just like the U.S. has to. But the French have not you know dropped the ball that far. I mean, they haven't closed as many. They haven't, you know, not not as many, not as many nuclear power plants. They're not on our are, role like we are. <laughs> are on the verge of really teetering. You know, they're they they're yeah, still. Yeah, no, they've got lots of inertia that they would have to overcome, and that's good. Yeah, but it's, it's not like uh, it can be done tomorrow. It's uh, that's that's true. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to add something to this discussion or conversation? Um, I just one little fun fact that I heard last night at my ANS meeting. I was, like I said, I was at Exelon and there were a bunch of people there that worked at Exelon that worked at ComEd, mm -hmm. which was what Exelon was before yeah. and at the nuclear plants. And uh, we were talking about load following. Right. Because one of the things that they said the new plants would have to do would be to load follow, which, which don't get me started on that. But anyway. You know, load following renewables. Why am I building renewables, right? But, but anyway, the uh, one of the things that uh, that was brought up was that they said that three or four of the plants um, did significant load following power fluctuation way up and way down, like all the way to zero. Right. Like or seventy percent or something. You know, some really big numbers, including the Zion plant, which was decommissioned in the nineties. Right. Um, and uh, so they and I was talking to one of the one of the uh, one of the nuclear engineers there that I know, and she's she told me that um, it while while ramping up and down does affect fuel usage a little bit, you still need to replace the fuel at you know at the same intervals. Yeah, uh, it doesn't really make a, a a lot of lot of difference there, right. so you don't really save any fuel money. Um, but if the rates are such in the you know open market that we have over here, if the if the rates change depending on you know, what's going on they might even get a negative rate even or something but yeah um, it might be beneficial to be able to do that and to uh to it, it might actually be a money saver in some cases but you know and those are for you know 30 40 year old reactors reactor designs and yeah. so so anyway i just i, I never I, I knew that you could do it but i never heard anybody talk about doing it to that extent and, and apparently I, back yeah. then i mean before they before the increase in in you know energy use had happened because those are you know like late 60s early 70s reactors yeah when they were built you know they the energy was still energy use was still growing and they didn't um there was a need they, for uh, it. They, so so sometimes they act the actual grid you know energy needed to be lowered by even the baseload plants right so 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 they so they could do that and All they right. did it and it was not a problem i mean you know maybe they had different control rods or whatever but uh, so that's you know anytime anybody tells you that it's you know not it, it's old ancient technology and it can only do stuff as well even back 40 years ago is doing stuff that nobody else can still do yeah right yeah. <laughs> cleanly nobody exactly. else can do it cleanly right yeah that's uh so I, I thought that was interesting amazing Thank you for uh, thank you for uh, you know taking taking a chunk out of your uh, yeah we out of your lunch squeezed it to, in today so. to, to talk to me and I appreciate uh, the flexibility yeah so I'll I'll say thank you to uh, all the people I'll that will uh, I'll try to do a, a better video shot next time <laughs> that's all right that's all right thank <laughs> you all bye bye all right take care.